Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here and say a very big thank you to uh, Bishop Michael for agreeing to do this. His audience won't be confined to the people online because I know there are a not insignificant number of people who actually would want to watch this on the recording. Uh, so the, the audience will be rather bigger. Um, welcome to you all. This is the second, second study in the Marks for Mission series. Um, so we're looking at mission in all its aspects. So we had Gail last week on um, preaching the gospel, um, Bishop Michael this week on making disciples. Next week, it's Richard from Chase, Chase Town who will be telling us about serving the community. And there he has certainly a story to tell in what he's been doing with Bert, Bert will be a friend during lockdown. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you to Bishop Michael. Uh, in a moment, I'll just say a collect and then we'll begin. Some of my colleagues from church won't know that Sue Jones has been admitted to hospital uh, with a gall gallstone issues. So just as we begin, can we just spend a few moments quiet and remember and pray for Sue? So in a moment's quiet, let's bring Sue before our Lord and then I'll pray a comment. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Praying this too for Sue. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Michael. Chris, how long do you want me to go on for to use the technical? Term? Um, we would aim to end the entire Bible study in about an hour, an hour and a quarter, something like that. Um, if you'd like to speak for 20 minutes, that's fine. But really, we're in your hands now. So okay. that's up to you now. Um, I think we're quite flexible. And you can see us all when we nod off as well, of course. <laughs> we'll see how we get on. Thank you very much indeed for um, inviting me. And uh, before I say anything else, I want to congratulate you all on having such an excellent programme um, for two reasons. I mean, one, that you are looking at the, the full breadth of the church's mission as you um, explore these five marks. And also for the time that you're doing this as you are as we are jointly poised to um, start a discernment process for a new parish priest uh, what a great way to inform yourselves uh, for that process by thinking about the future mission of your church and um, as a corollary to that the ministry that will best serve that mission so I think it's great uh, and I like, I do in principle like the um, the format of a Bible study um, leading into discussion with a practical focus. But I have to say that I am seized with abject terror at the appearance of Stephen on one of the screens because I'm going to be talking about the new. <laughs> It does that to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you if you'd rather just kind of listen to some music or something, Stephen, I didn't tell you. <laughs> um, so, the the second uh, mark that that you've asked me to lead some in, lead you into some thoughts about is uh, to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. And you know, as the language immediately says. Um, that mark is absolutely central to the life of the church, its continuing life, and to its growth in every sense of the word growth. Um, the, the texts that I thought we could look at um, are from the fir Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, and particularly from the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians uh, because the themes of teaching, 
baptizing and nurturing um, occur prominently in those three chapters. And Corinth seems to be a good place um, to begin from because we know it was a church full of what one could call new believers. There's those constant references to the former state of those who were called to be Christians. So presumably that means they were new believers. Um, and also I find Corinth, I always find immense um, reassurance in reading the Corinthian correspondence because Corinth was a very, very quarrelsome, um, divided and uh, troublesome church. And it is so reassuring to know that Christians and churches have been like that from the beginning. Um, the kind of the challenges that we face now are by no means new. Um, they've been with us right from the start. So, as I say, um, all three themes are present in the first three chapters, uh, but they come in an interesting order, which I'll say a bit more about uh, in a moment. And then I'm now going to say, if I can rely on your prayers, I'm going to try and share my screen, uh, which would be this one. Share. If I go slideshow, can you see that? That looks fine. Yes, that looks fine. Good. Well, that's fairly minimal content so far. So if we go to the next screen, um, I mean, you can divide up um, current, 1 Corinthians in all sorts of ways, but here's just a rough sketch of what is, from, from for our purposes, of what is uh, in those first three chapters. Paul begins by greeting the church at Corinth. Uh, he then launches into um, a, a, a deploring of the divisions within the church uh, and within that touches uh, on the theme of baptism. Uh, the rest of chapter one, he moves into talking about the wisdom of God and from that into his proclamation and about being taught by the spirit, which I think is where I would particularly like us to look at some of the themes about teaching. And then in chapter three, um, because, because it's in the second mark of mission, I think one could gloss these chapters as being about nurturing. Uh, and we'll come to this a bit later, but he uses two images and there's a kind of pivotal verse in verse nine where he, he puts the two alongside one another of growing uh, as in a field and of building as in a building. So all three themes, um, as you can see from that little um, sketch, are there in these first three chapters. But look at the order in which they come. Um, the Anglican mark of mission has teach, baptise, nurture. Here they are in the order baptise, teach, nurture. Um, and for Paul, it seems to me that baptism actually comes first, uh, not only in the structure of 1 Corinthians, but in his own life too. Um, he's he's baptised immediately, um, pretty much immediately after his uh, conversion. And I think it does raise the question, where does baptism fit logically? I mean, if you like the uh, the teach, baptise, nurture order, as in the Anglican mark of mission, is the logical order. You teach someone, they understand the faith, then you baptise them, then you nurture them in it. But in practice, of course, as we know, um, in pastoral reality, often baptism comes well before teaching uh, and nurture, and that seems to be um, what's going on here too. And Paul is not really... Um, that interested in baptism, at least not as something that he's come to do himself. Um, he is in Corinth to proclaim, to teach. Um, the references to baptism are significant, but they are a bit negative uh, and they are rather confused, as we shall see. Here is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul's not really interested himself in baptising people, um, but we see that he does get caught up in it. And in fact, uh, we also see something else quite reassuring about this great apostle, that he is really rubbish 
at keeping records of what he's done. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12 onwards, what I mean is that each of you says I belong to Paul or I belong to Apollos or I belong to Cephas or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptised none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that none can say that you were baptised in my name. I did baptise also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a kind of laugh out loud um, passage really that the mess that Paul gets into of confidently asserting he baptized nobody and then qualification after qualification and finally he has to admit his memory has failed him. You will see here uh, clearly the division into parties in the Corinthian church uh, which reappears later uh, in the 1 Corinthians in um, chapter 11 where it shows itself in abuses at when the church comes together to celebrate the lord's supper um and you have those four parties at least um outlined in verse 12 paul apollos cephas and christ paul and apollos both active in corinth Cephas or Peter may be an appeal to external authority. Christ, who are the people who say they believe belong to the party of Christ? Um, might they be people trying to make an effort at unity or might they be actually rather irritating people who are kind of super spiritual and say, well, you're all party people, but we belong to the no party party, whatever it may be. Interesting to know how people read that. But baptism in this divided context feels as if it is a badge um, belonging to different groups and it feels a bit as if um, leaders are claiming or people are imagining that different leaders are in some sense claiming ownership of the people whom they have baptised and we know perfectly well that in the history of Christian missions that sort of competitiveness um, if you like um, trophy hunting where I've I've got more people than you or I've converted or I've baptized more people than you has been um, you know something that's been around um, maybe a little bit of competition has actually spurred people into evangelistic zeal but it can also be um, deeply and unhelpfully divisive but for Paul um, having got in a mess about how many people he baptised or didn't baptise, um, he really wants to make the important move from baptism to teaching, proclamation or teaching. Um, and he would like to say that it's at that point that he really comes onto the Corinthian scene, though, as you can see from all the, all the qualifications there, uh, things are actually a little bit more complicated than that so baptism and then as i say uh, not in the order that the second mark of mission gives them but but in the order in which they seem to happen here and in which they seem to be quite often to happen in the church's life teaching and um this is just a little bit of that great um discussion in 1 corinthians chapter 2 uh, where there is a constant, both a contrast and a juxtaposition of human activity and divine activity and of human wisdom and divine wisdom as being the context in which teaching takes place. And notice the phrase towards the end, taught by the spirit. Um, I'll come back to that. I think there are two kind of ways of taking that into our understanding. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
verses 11 to 13. These um, translations are all the new revised standard version, I should say. For what human being knows what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's, except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. So as I say, there's that interesting contrast and juxtaposition of human teaching and the spirit's teaching and whatever saint paul meant by that i think it could have been heard or received or taken on board in in two ways by the corinthians and certainly has been in the history of the church one is to say that paul in particular is gifted by the spirit so his teaching is not just uh, human teaching but the spirit's teaching his teaching is different from the teaching of others so you better listen to it but corinthians might also hear alongside that um, the belief that the spirit or the experience that the spirit is given to each one of them to each uh, Christian in the church at Corinth and therefore each one receives the truth of the spirit in his or her own heart and is taught in that sense by the spirit and I think there is a tension here really the first um, account that I've the first kind of way of understanding that stresses the authority of the apostolic teaching um, as communication of a truth. And the second, if you like, stresses each person's learning through their own spiritual gifting. And when we talk about the teaching of the church, I think it's really um, important that we hold those two together in some kind of creative tension. If we just emphasize the first, uh, then we can easily fall under authoritarian patterns of leadership. And we see that um, in parts of the church today, whether that is um, authoritarian in the sense of a kind of institutional office, heavily backed um, with powers of sanction, or whether it's authoritarian in the sense of a charismatic leader who imposes himself or herself, I have to say normally himself, uh, on people with their own understanding of what the scriptures teach. So you can lapse into authoritarianism in how we understand teaching. If we emphasize just the second, the one that begins from everybody receiving the spirit and being communicated to by the spirit, um, without any uh, external um, constraint, then you can lead to chaos with no agreed pattern of truth to hold the community together. So I think when we, when you, um, as you go through this exercise of thinking what your mission is, think about how you teach the Christian faith to new believers, or indeed how you teach the Christian faith to people who've been believers for a very long time. You need to ask how we do that in ways that both give a clear sense of direction and also give a clear sense of <clears throat> space and freedom for people to find out for themselves. I mean, in a sense, we should never teach just talk just about teaching, but always about teaching and learning. And I think that, that holding those two together 
is uh, is really important. So baptism and teaching and then the third verb in this second mark of mission is nurture and i'm going to uh, move to chapter three um and a rather longer passage here um which begins as you can see in slightly um paul in what must have come across i think to almost anybody as paul in rather patronizing mode um, perhaps with good reason but nevertheless um that's that's how i read it anyway um but the point that he's making is that people need to grow um and so the image of nurturing uh captured in this first verse is by moving on from milk to solid food is a sign of that growth of individuals and growth of the church collectively um I'm going to read through this in a minute. Uh, it's it's a longer passage. Again, Paul comes back to the schisms, the divisions, Apollos and Paul, just those two on this occasion. And then he develops two analogies. Um, and I've highlighted a little bit of the text in yellow. You'll see when we get to the next screen. And he also, um, the other thing I want to pick out is he says a couple of things about ministers so as we think about nurturing it's the analogies for nurture and the ministry that serves that nurture the ministry words I've picked out in green so let me read this 1 Corinthians 3 1 to 11 and so brothers and sisters I could not speak to you as spiritual people but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. <clears throat> for as long as there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the water the one who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose and each will receive wages according to the labour of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. But no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So as I said, I've highlighted um, in two colours there, um, a bit in yellow, about the two images that Paul uses for the church here, field and building, remarkably in the same half verse. And in green <clears throat> on this screen and on the previous scene, about two uh, expressions that Paul uses for the servant ministry. And I think we need to think about both the green and the yellow. Um, in terms of the yellow, what kind of reality do we understand our church to be? What kind of image do we use for it? And in terms of the green, what kind of ministry are we looking for to serve um, mission, the mission of the church? So the yellow first. Um, 
as I said, there are two different images of the church, two different images of growth, if you like. Uh, and you can look at them in different ways. I'm looking at the first of those verses there now, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. God's field, God's building. Um, in terms of method, um, you could say the field shows a, an organic method of growth. I mean, things just grow. I know it's a bit more complicated than that now with uh, agricultural technology, but basically things grow. Um, whereas the building is constructed. So there's a great deal more um, control over it, if you like. Or in terms of degree of control, you could say one is natural uh, and one is planned. Uh, in terms of the source of the imagery, as I've put at the top of the screen, you could say one is drawn from agriculture and one is drawn from architecture. But it's really important to remember that in both those uh, field, uh, th those areas of imagery, the divine power for Paul sits behind all human effort. Uh, so talking about the field, he says, it is God who gives the growth. And talking about the building, it, he says, it is Christ who is the foundation. So you have two kinds of nurture language um, set alongside one another, the agricultural and the architectural. Um, and in other bits of the New Testament epistles, I think you can trace some fusion of those two for example in 1 peter chapter 2 like living stones let yourselves be built into a spiritual house we just kind of talk about living stones but it is an extraordinary expression when you think about it living stones so you've got the organic and the um the the, the constructional put together or ephesians 2 21 in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So you've got the language of growth and building alongside each other. Um, and I would say those two um, ways of thinking about the church, the natural and the planned, if you like, the agricultural and the architectural, belong together, but they can be distinguished. And sometimes, and in fact, more than sometimes, quite often, um, we pull them apart uh, and focus just on one or the other. And that can have uh, really bad consequences. Let's give you a, a quotation from a book by a German, uh, I don't know if you call him a missiologist or just a writer on church growth called Christian Schwarz, um, book called Natural Church Development, and he is talking precisely about what he calls these two poles of um, church growth and therefore of nurture of people in the church, the agricultural and the architectural. Um, he actually says every church and every Christian needs to be bipolar, which I think is probably an unfortunate um, bit of um, translation, German really. Um, but you get the point. You need to hold the two together. And he says, um, what happens if you don't? It's possible to take the institutional pole. He's talking there really about the, the architectural and treat it as the whole. People who are influenced by this thought pattern are convinced that only the right pole, the architectural one, has the correct form. That if only the right pole has the correct form, of doctrine or political persuasion or church growth program or whatever, then they don't have to worry about the left pole, by which he means the dynamic life of the organism called church, the organism. And then he says the cycle can also break down on the left pole. In this case, the organic pole is separated from its technical counterpart. Forms and programs and structures and institutions are considered spiritually irrelevant and perhaps even harmful. And then in a very um, 
and I mean this largely in a positive sense, in a very Germanic way, he goes on to distinguish those two paradigms of separating one from the other, uh, calling them the hyper-technical paradigm and the hyper-spiritual paradigm. And he says the hyper-technical paradigm is associated with dogmatism, fundamentalism, legalism, sacramentalism, traditionalism, monopolism, not sure what that is, clericalism, conservatism, etc. The hyper-spiritual paradigm is associated with relativism, eclecticism, libertinism, sounds quite fun, spiritualism, docetism, separatism, individualism, anarchism, quietism, etc. And to get the sense of that, um, those great lists of isms, you have to remember this is translated from the German and how much more impressive they would be if it had been a list of ismuses, uh, one after the other. So I think you may get a little bit carried away there, but you get the kind of sense of those, those two being pulled apart. And whatever, um, you know, you can, you can over, over, overstretch the distinction, um, but I think it's a helpful way into thinking, what do we mean by nurture? And the question for us then, in terms of the yellow words I highlighted, what, where, does, where does your church fit into that, uh, on that organic to planned uh, understanding of itself, the agricultural to the architectural? And then the other thing, just to finish off uh, before I start kind of rabbiting on, um, the words that I highlighted in green, you may remember there were two words about service. Um, here they are, both from chapter three. What then is Apollos? This is verse five. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, and the Greek word there is diakonoi, through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. That's one of the words translated servants in the NRSV. And in verse nine, we are God's servants, completely different word, synergoi, working together. Again, translated servants. Um, so if we think about mission and we think about the ministry that is assigned to enable and facilitate that mission, particularly in this dimension of nurture. <clears throat> Here in just a few verses, you have two different expressions of ministry as service, and both of them are important. If you look at the first one in verse five, servant as diakonos, I think this is really looking at individuals, at Apollos, at Paul, at Christian leaders um, at people who are given particular ministries to fulfill. Um, diakonos, of course, is the same as our word deacon. And Paul handles the tension between Apollos and himself by stressing, if you like, their differentiation, the fact that they've been given different tasks in God's purposes to do, each in their own place, each with their own work to fulfill. Whereas when you get to the second um, bit about servant ministry, the word is very different, synergoi, uh, as you can imagine, that is exactly the same root from which we derive our word synergy. In other words, the emphasis here is on working together, not on ministry as a particular task assigned to a particular individual, but if you like, on ministry as a team, working with one another. And in fact, in the Greek um, original, it's not just that these are human ministers working together, but they're also working together with God. They are synergoi, synergoi with God. So there's this great sense of partnership of human and divine. And as uh, the quest for a new incumbent for your parish begins, I just think that might be a helpful uh, way into thinking about the ministry of 
that person, at least in relation to the task of nurturing uh, the body of the church, that there are two questions to ask really. Um, what particular tasks for this person, what particular areas of work would be given to him or her would they be expected to complete and what therefore what gifts and experience would they need for that that's the kind of diakonos question if you like and then what overall task in coordinating the ministry of the whole team of creating synergy um, is there in the life of the church at present and again what gifts and experiences would you be looking for for that uh, bearing in mind that this is the same person um, who's got to do both the the individual um, assigned task and the overall coordinating task um, so those are some of the things that 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 for me um on a very very superficial reading of these uh, verses from 1 Corinthians fell out as I was thinking about baptizing about teach baptize nurture or baptize teach nurture and about the um, ministry that you will be looking for that we will all be looking for um, to support that dimension of mission as nurture and I just wondered if these questions might be helpful for you, uh, but there might be others, um, or they might not be helpful at all. Um, how do teaching, baptising and nurturing relate to one another in the life of our church? How do, how do those three fit together? Not just in what order, but how do they fit together? When you look at the life of St Michael's, or indeed St John's Wall, is the best analogy for the church a field or a temple? In other words, is the patterns of nurture about um, drawn from agriculture or from architecture, organic or planned, or both? Um, and what's the balance between them? And then the ministry question of what kind of individual service and what kind of shared service are you looking for? Um, in ministry. As I say, those are the questions that I drew from the text, but uh, you might have many others of completely different ones, and you might have completely different questions that you want to ask uh, of your church in this dimension of the second mark of mission. Um, I think I'm going to stop at that point. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see each other. And Chris, I don't know how you want to structure this. I mean, do people just